grace, all is well with our soul. Yes. Okay, so I just want to say uh, thank you for your patience. We had a little, a little uh, glitch this morning, but we're, we are here. Some of you are online on YouTube, and some of you are on Zoom. So we welcome all of you, however you're joining us, whether you're in person or online. Uh, this is our second Sunday after Pentecost, and my name is Donna, and I am your liturgist today. So, uh, if you, for those on Zoom or for those who will be on Zoom, please remember to keep yourself muted, especially when we sing the hymns. Unmute yourself when you do the response. If you are unmuted, make sure your room is quiet. Uh, today is the first Sunday of the month, so we will be celebrating Holy Communion in a few moments. So friends on Zoom, please, and people online, please have your elements ready. Please continue to share your prayers for Silver, the director of YCVM, our mission partner, for God's healing love, peace, and strength as he recovers from his injuries and financial support to help his family navigate this difficult time. We do have a donation box in the back on the so in the social hall and we will be collecting donations until the end of July. The 176th California Nevada Annual Conference Session will be held on June 7th through the 10th in Sacramento. Our lay members, Charlie, Brenda, and Pastor Mayna will be attending. This year, the conference offering will benefit the African University to establish a, follow, excuse me, a scholarship fund for young people from the West Angola Conference. Please put this special offering in the offering envelope and write your name and ACS on the envelope or make your check payable to CCUMC in the memo write ACS. So please give generously today. Uh, they'll be taking the offering next weekend. Okay. Uh, now i like to say we need to share our prayers for traveling mercies for Brother Ben as he is now on a cross-country cross bike ride with the Fuller Center for Housing for two months. He will be building houses along the route from Seattle to Washington, D.C. I want to share a little bit about his ride. He started on the 24th, so today is the third day, and he's still in Washington at Sky Comish, riding from Sky Comish to Sunny Slope. If you guys know Washington, then you know what, what I'm talking about. I have no idea, but that's where they are, and Today, they are climbing around 3,000 feet, so hopefully they have really strong legs to do this. And then once they hit the top, the first 15 miles uh, is, a, is a downhill stretch, so I think they'll enjoy that. So um, Another uh, thing I wanted to point out is that 97% 90, of the money donated goes towards building houses. So, uh, so this Fuller Center has a very low overhead, so that's great that the money goes straight to those houses. And if you think that they're staying at these nice motels or something like that, they're actually staying at uh, churches along the way. Okay, so just remember to keep them in your prayers. All right, save the date. Our new associate pastor, Reverend Ivana Hang, and her family will come and worship with us on June 30th. We will hold a joint service at 10 a.m. and a welcome party for them after worship. So come and welcome her and her family as she is starting her ministry with us in July. Now, I'd like you all to take a deep breath. And please stand if you're able for our call to worship. Those on Zoom, you may unmute yourself to join the response that's in the bold print. Holy One, you have searched and known us. We know when we sit down and how we can rise up and we start off our thoughts. You search out our paths and our lying downs and are acquainted with all our ways. Even you are the You hem us in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon us. We praise you all, we are grateful and wonderfully praised. Friends, our God is calling 
all he loves. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I was too anxious. Okay. Now, friends, God is calling all he loves to gather us in, to rejoice in his love. Let us raise our voice and sing, gather us in. Please remain standing as you are able. Here in this place, the light is streaming. Now is the darkness when vanished away. Peace and dark space, our views and our dreamings, brought here to you in the light of this day. Gather us in the lost and forsaken. Gather us in, in blind and the lame. Call to us now. Out of your name. We are the young, alas, of the mystery. We are the old who yearns for our face. We cut the sea through our humble history, called to be light to the whole human race. Gather us in the rich and the haughty. Gather us seen and proud and the strong. Not of our heart to begin so lowly. Give us the courage to enter the song. Here we will take the wine and the water. Here we will take the bread of new birth. Here you shall call your son and your daughters. What us the news to be sought of the years? Give us to drink the wine of compassion. Give us to eat the bread that is you. Nourish us well, no gift to, to fashion. Lives that are holy and hearts that are true. Not in the dark of building confining, not in some heavens light years away, but here in this place a new light is shining. Now is the kingdom, now is the day. Gather us in and hold us forever. Gather us in and make us our own. Gather together by our love in our flesh and our bones. Please be seated. Let us pray. We thank you, loving God, for the surprises which you spring on us. You take the unlovely and cherish them the mediocre and make them gifted, the mere nobodies and ordain them your apostles. You entrust us with an authority and ministry far beyond our own strength. We are reticent, yet under your patient care, we discover that all things are possible to those who love you. Surprise, surprise us again, loving friends. Surprise us with the Christ who believes in us and the grace which is made perfect in human weakness creating God and Prince of Peace Son. This past week, the world community recognized the May 30th International Day of United Nations, UN Peacekeepers. For 76 years, UN Peacekeepers have worked to save and change lives in the world's most fragile political and security situation. Protect international men and women who have sacrificed a comfortable and secure life in their home countries to provide technical assistance and a peaceful presence in some of the most dangerous regions of the world today. We pray for so many seeking peace and security in countries on the Mediterranean coast and in the sea. 
Cyprus, Golan, Jerusalem, and Lebanon host UN peacekeepers today. We pray for an end to religious warfare in a region home to Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, and so many followers of Islam. We pray that all men, women, and children will someday know peace and economic stability and may live outside of the shadows of external peacekeepers. May those of us not directly impacted by the presence of foreign peacekeepers and separated loved ones always realize our, ne our necessary commitment to peace, security, and human development beyond our native borders. As we pray, we remember our brothers and sisters who are lonely, weak, and ill, especially Sister Helena, Brother Lay, and Director Silver. We ask that you surround them with all your presence, love, and healing grace. We also pray for the summer session of the Homework Club, which begins tomorrow. Lord, we ask your blessings, guidance, and protection for Director Christine, the tutors, and the students as they come to this place to connect, study, and play. We pray all these in the name of the resurrected Jesus who taught us to pray. Let us now pray the Lord's Prayer together in unison. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I now invite Peggy to read today's scriptures. Our scripture reading this morning comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 2 to 10. Now let us listen with our whole selves to what the Holy Spirit has to say to us today. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Was caught up into paradise and heard things that are not to be told no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than what is seen in me or heard from me. Even considering the exceptional character of the revelations, Therefore, to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that he would leave me. But he said to me, But grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of God for the people of God. I now invite Pastor Mena to give us a message. Thank you, Peggy, for the reading, and Donna for the inviting. You know, I have a new pair of glasses, and it doesn't seem to work very well. I hope I can really read clearly, but you bear with me. Yes. So, friends, um, how do you like Paul's a letter in the New Testament? You said, hmm. <laughs> you know, I quite enjoy reading Paul's letter. And you know why? Because through his letters, you can easily see who Paul is and feel his heart, his passion. You know, he's definitely on fire to share the gospel of Christ. 
and his character is full of integrity and singular focus. And his thought process and consideration, you know, he's all both um, sensitive and profound. And his personality really is so direct and frank. That's who he is. And we must understand the letters of Paul that we read and we read are responses to letters he has first received or news of churches and issues they are fa that they are facing that have come to him. So we do not entirely, entirely know the issues or problems he is seeking to solve, resolve. Then we can make some educated guess and inferences. We must also understand that when Paul wrote these letters, he had no idea that they would be preserved and shared and ultimately become a part of the Bible. And he had no idea that we would be reading them like some 2,000 years later. And so we might wonder, oh, if these letters would, were not written to us or for us so many generations later, then why in the world do we need to read them? What do you think? Well, despite the letters not being written to us or for us directly, we can trust that situations that he needs to address are rooted in common human problem. They are common human problems. Basic human needs and the human conditions have never really changed. And Paul's state of mind as he addresses this and the faithful reflections he, bring, he brings forward are surely full of life and wisdom. That's why we still read them. God still speak to us through them. So God, you know, really God is living and he knows our need. So he would use the same wisdom for us. You know, the Corinthian church was located in Corinth. It's a very prosperous and important city of the time. And the church was one of that full of, you know, gifts and grace. So many people in the church, very knowledgeable and also gifted. And after Paul encountered Jesus and began following him, his emphasis, his emphasis was on salvation by faith and not by observing law. You know, you know, the Jews, they need to be uh, circumcised. That's really important in their life or to be God's people. And that's also important part in the law. They need to do that, follow the law in order to be called Abraham's uh, children, to be in the part of the salvation. But Paul said, no, you are safe because you have faith. So this emphasis made Paul a thorn, a thorn in the sight of other Jews who felt that this emphasis was in opposition to Judaism. They continually found reasons and occasion to attack him. On the other hand, so Paul was attacked by Jews. On the other hand, he also attacked by Christian Jews who are jealous of him. You know, they spread rumors to hurt him and according, ac accusing him of not always following Jesus. Actually, he did not follow Jesus, like Jesus' disciples. So these disciples were really mocking him. Oh, you're not one of us. You're not really true disciples of Jesus. So you're not worthy of being called an apostle in that case. And not like Peter, he is really the orthodox among us. So while Paul had no interest in defending himself, the accusations and criticisms were becoming 
more over the top. And then he was forced to respond. And so when he responded, you can feel that the way he speak it, you know, the, the words really with fire, with anger sometimes. So we can certainly pick up his anger and frustration for this. Between the lines of his letter, he begins by making clear that why he was forced, opposed to Jesus. Jesus showed himself to Paul and allowed himself to be known by Paul. Next, Paul asserts that he had very, a very uh, unusual spiritual experience in which he drew very close to God. That is the beginning of our scripture reading today. Paul doesn't explicitly say that he was the one who had the experience, but rather says that it happened to someone he knew. And what was the experience? That he was caught up to the third heaven. What you might ask, what is the third heaven? What is the second? Yes, or even the first. Or how many, how many levels in heaven altogether? I mean, in Chinese, they, have, they say the hell. There are 18 hells in, in the hell, yeah. But they did not mention because they don't have the idea of heaven. They don't have any description about heaven, you know. And we did not get any description more than this, the third heaven. Well, I would imagine this is something that only God knows, right? Yeah. And Paul's intention here is not for us to ask, yes, how many levels in heaven, but to express. He just wants to express a profoundly spiritual and mystical experience. There was beyond words to describe and Paul casually mentions the third heaven without fully describing the experience so that to this day, the third heaven remains a mystery. You know, in today's church, we can see that there are not just a few fellow Christians who made profound spiritual and mystical experience a goal. They want to seek that kind of special spiritual experience. And yet, Paul makes clear that this is God's extraordinary grace. It's upon God. It's so that it's not something we can request or demand. We can, we can pray to ask to, to have this chance, opportunity to encounter or to receive this extraordinary spiritual experience, but not demand God. So today, many Christians seek to seek after uh, charismatic experiences. There are even preachers who teach the necessity of speaking in tongues or healing, resulting in those who have these gifts become prideful and you know they even look down on other people's experience of faith. You cannot speak in tongue, you don't have spirit in you. They kind of using this as a sign of spirit in you. And I think that is just really uh, too the too very extreme and I would not really highly you know recommend that. So this is certainly a worry of Paul's. And I would be, of course, I want everybody to have that spiritual, special spiritual experience. But when we have it, we praise it, right? We praise the Lord for it. But we also need to think, what then? I have this special spiritual experience. What comes after that? We need to ask not just really indulging ourselves, having, owning that kind of uh, experience. So I, you know, I think uh, what's more important is this. What happened uh, when we had this experience? How do our life change? How do our life change because of this? 
coming full circle, we see here that Paul shares his unique experience and testimony in the third person. He wanted to speak all this in experience in third person. He wanted, wanted to say it directly, say me, I, I was taken up. He just said somebody I knew. Why he wanted to do this? I think he wanted to do that because he wanted to avoid misunderstanding that he is somewhat boasting. Yeah, he doesn't want people to think, oh, you're just boasting because only yourself have that kind of experience and you are more loved by our God, that kind of understanding. And instead, uplift how his own weaknesses, the challenges he had encountered as he shares the good news and even that he has a thorn in his flesh that causes great suffering. What is the thorn that Paul speaks of? We, it's not clear when we read from the Bible, right? It's really, we feel the murkiness in the text itself. And there are a variety of answers and no consensus. Paul only said that this thorn causes him to be humble and never arrogant. So it seems obviously this thorn is a defect to him, a weakness. The New Interpreter's Bible explained it like this. There was an illness, an illness that haunted Paul like a thorn in his body. And it was not necessarily as a bone spur. You know, many others think it's a, a, like a thorn. It must be some you know, spur, bone spur, uh, in between the spine, like that. And so some scholars uh, theorize that Paul's illness was in his eyes. Why did they say that? Let's find out. Okay, so you might remember, I don't know if you remember or noticed that, Paul experienced that great light, right? He, he went to, he wanted to go to Damascus, and then he wanted to persecute uh, the uh, Christian there, right? So on the way on, uh, to Damascus, Damascus, and as a result, he, was, he went blind because the light shine on his eyes, right? And when I say bright, it's really only temporarily, just a few days. And perhaps, according to the scholars, perhaps his eyes never recover fully after that. And why this possibility? Because first, in Galatians, Paul writes, what has become of the good will, good will you felt? For I testify that had it not, had it been possible, you would have torn out your eyes and given them to me. What happened? You would say this. So the church in Galatia was the one that Paul founded. When Paul was among them, he was ill. But the Galatians fully accepted him, very kind to accept him. And then so kind, in, so kind, in fact, Paul trusted that. If it were possible, they would tear out their own eyes to give them to Paul. So this created the possibility that Paul's thorn had to do with his eyes. Secondly, Paul writes a bit uh, later, he says, see what large letter I made when I am writing on my own hand, in my own hand. Uh, I don't know, uh, perhaps you, you, you notice that people with really very weak eyesight, a poor vision, they need to look things so closely, right? Like a blind person, or even they need to use can to walk. And perhaps today you will say, oh, it's, it just need reading glasses. Perhaps they don't have reading glasses at that time, right? And so, but clearly he, he couldn't really see clearly, so he need to write the letters so big, 
right? Like we need to read larger print today, yeah. So 30, 30, Romans were written with the help of a scribe. That's he said you know, in, in, the, in the letter. So that, that's why the scholars just you know, make all this uh, guess, the thorn, the defect. In his body, in his flesh, is the problem in his eyes. So we still not confirm that he has this problem. We're just guessing. Uh, but this problem caused him uh, so much suffering and thinking he is not perfect. So he would not, he uses, he, he said this is his weakness, but how God worked through him, even with this weakness, to do great work for the gospel. So today I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, what is your thorn? What is your thorn in your flesh, in your body? What is your weakness? You know, I have a colleague who's, whose mother's body has a thorn. Quite big one, uh, in my view. She has had uh, allergic reactions to pungent odors for over 50 years. She is allergic to many, many odors and works hard to avoid any strong odors, including from onions, garlic, ginger, det detergent, shampoo, toothpaste, and chemical fragrances, of course, and even medicines. Can you imagine what kind of life she was? If she smelled this thing, she becomes itchy already, automatically. And then her heart tightens. She has difficulty breathing. She starts sweating profusely, and she gets rash. This phenomenon is certainly a thorn to her, a very wearing one. Her family is also unable to relax. They have always need to avoid, you know, avoid using things that have, have these orders. So she once told her husband, she felt that her prayers in her younger days were much more effective and, than they were in their older years. And she's just wondering why. It seems that like God not hearing, hear my prayers, not as, you know, as well as the years before. So her husband, told her, when you were younger, you didn't have much faith, so you pleaded with God for miracles. Now you do not need those miracles. You have enough faith to get by on God's grace. Well, she settled with this answer. She suffered with this condition for so long that the, the congregation in her church once asked her how she was able to endure it. And she said, my hearts hold gratitude. I know that there are those in the world who are suffering far worse than I. And God gave me a great partner, friends, children. Aren't we feel so blessed? When I die, I go back to my heavenly father. My relatives are here. Oh, my relatives are there with God, and my relatives are also here with me. I live my days very well, with joy. And she would always encourage the church community, meet with those who were ill, and encourage them in their treatment and to look forward to the days when they would recover their health. The thorn of hers had long ago been transformed into a blessing. So whatever weakness and humility her illness gave her, enabled Christ's grace and power to be seen in her and through her so much more powerfully. 
her long-standing illness and her steadfast patience through it, through it all, meant that the encouragement and witness he had to others carries with it extra, extra comfort and strength because she had been to it. Therefore, her testimony, her encouragement, so powerful. That's why we say God's power manifested through weaknesses. So just as Paul brought new perspective to the thorn in his flesh, it became something that he did not have to endure, but, to find, but could find joy in it. He could boast around about it because he deeply believed that when we face sorrow and difficulty, we must hold on ever more tightly to God's promise and lean on God's words so that we can journey through each day with peace. So we experience all sorts of thorns in our lives. We have different thorns in our body. And even so, even more in our senior years, right? We often joke, when we are young, the problem comes and then they go, right? But when we are old, the problem comes and they stay, right? So many thorns in our body, right? And sometimes, sometimes our thorns are part of our character, our personality. We perhaps we are, we born negative. I think she, I should not say born up. We kind of we are we are. We are stubborn, right? And we are timid. We, we have that fear in us. We never dare to speak out, right? Things like that, 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 that person in us, that personality in us, right? And we tend to, uh, we like to depend on others, right? Things like that. Or short temper or pride and all that. And sometimes, you know, all these things, with all the thorns, that kind of thorn in us, we, we hurt people. Right? And also that and also because of that people hurt us. We hurt one another because of that thorn in our body, in our a character. But God gave each of us such amazing grace for beyond what we can understand and what God promises is God's grace is sufficient for us. God's grace is sufficient for us. When I think of, you know, we all have these weaknesses in every one of us. But somehow we know each other very well. We know, I know, not, I'm not so sure I know everybody's thorn. But even I noticed, I, I would say, even with your thorn, I love you. Right? I love you in, with God's love. And I think that's amazing grace we experience in this community. See how long you've been in this church? 60 years, right? Some of you, right? And you know each other more than three decades or so. How can you still endure, <laughs> endure the, the, the thorn or the <laughs> weaknesses in the personalities, right? And I think that's God's grace, to have that love for you to love others in their weaknesses, right? So the Jesus that Paul so loved to share about was nailed to cross. The most humiliating, most disgraceful, most weak act of that time. You know, the most powerful empire in the old time would be, I would say, the Roman Empire, right? The Roman Empire oppressed Christianity, community, uh, Christian community in the beginning for so long. And, but this Roman empi uh, Empire broke apart into Western and Eastern Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire was destroyed I will give you a history, test in history. Do you know when it was destroyed, the Western Roman Empire? 
No, okay. It's in <laughs> 476, common era, okay? 476 CE. And the Eastern Roman Empire lasts really long and fell to the same fate in 1453. So long, right? But yet, even so long, it also fell, also destroyed. Yet, let's see, Christianity remains even today and one of the world's largest religions. So once the Christian church was so weak, right? And even people consider cross a shame. But still God's power worked through all these things that people think not worthy, shame and not and and not not good, make them into powerful things that show God's mighty power. So this is the greatest witness and testimony to the weakness of humanity transformed to strength through God. So beloved brothers and sisters, let us take seriously the precious lesson from Paul today. We may have enough, may we have enough faith when faced with challenges. May we see them as gift in disguise. I was originally wanted to say, may you see them as test from Jesus, but I really want to say it another way. Gift in disguise from Jesus. And learn to see them, learn, learn to accept them, learn to use them. And like Paul, lift, um, lift up grateful hearts. God surely can use this gift to make us more humble and compassionate. And so that his strength can work through our weakness and transform that weakness into a unique grace and strength that bless us and bless others. So may all the glory be to God. Amen. Pastor, so as we reflect on, there's no question today, but let's reflect on our weaknesses and our thorns and know that, uh, that God's grace is there. Yes. So, because Jesus Christ is in us and we in him, his peace is a powerful gift that we may share with others. Let us pass the peace of Christ to our brothers and sisters in Christ and to all the children of God by saying, the peace of Christ be always with you. So, Leila, Manuel, you can unmute yourself and pass the peace of Christ. Okay. You are now invited to share joys and concerns for yourself, your community, and God's world so that we might lift them up in common prayer. When you share uh, people on Zoom, <laughs> you may unmute yourself. Uh, after all who would like to name their joys and concerns, we'll, we will respond by singing, Oh Lord, hear our prayers. Hey, Zoom world, anybody, you have any prayer requests? Ayla, unmute yourself. Do you want to say something? No. <laughs> we're, we're the only one on Zoom. I'm, we're glad you're on Zoom. We're very glad you can join us. All right. 
And we see Vincent. Thank you, Vincent. Anybody here in the congregation, in the pews? Tony, yes, Tony. As a day on the Saturday, June 1st and June 2nd, weekend of first month at the beginning, and the Berkeley Folks Festivals on Saturday. I am going to the library on Saturday. And it's pretty nice to book for you and join and a good weekend I have won today. Have a good time and great first month has the beginning. That will be it. Thank you, Tony. Anybody else? Brenda. I, I pray that um, the ceasefire will really happen because that's what's in the news is that Prime Minister Netanyahu and the Hamas are having this agreement to cease fire for a while and to return the hostages. So let's pray that they will go with their word and follow through because this is what we're all been praying for is a ceasefire and peace not just in the Middle East, but in Ukraine and Russia and all over the world of uh, many people fighting. So um, may the Lord's will be done. Um, I want to pray for where I live on my court. There were two very sad things that happened this week. You may have heard on the news about this big public market being burned down in Casha Valley. Well, there are neighbors they're a Korean family, wonderful family, three sons who built this business 10 years ago. They just lived three doors down from us, the mother and father. And it was a wonderful market, a community market. They had vendors, different Asian businesses, and was thriving. And it burned down mysteriously in the middle of the night. And they could not put out the fire, and it was destroyed totally. So pray for the Cho family. And my next door neighbor, bless his heart, Calvin Johnson passed away. He's almost, I think, 90 years old, but wonderful neighbor since 1978. So these are wonderful friends that um, we moved in together around the same time um, in, on our court. We have a very friendly court of neighbors. So this is our next door neighbor, so pray for the Johnson family. It's always so sad to lose friends, no matter what age. But anyways, um, pray for all the people that are ill in our church, for Helena, for the names you mentioned, um, Bing, 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 and um, others. Um, pray for uh, Mei Wei, right? Mei Wei. Um, so many that we don't know, but they're ill and suffering. So, um, Lord, keep us all safe and healthy. And I would like us to pray for those who are uh, on a trip, traveling at, during this time, including Ben and also Yvonne and Albert in uh, Malaysia. And also, Charlie and Brenda and I are going to the annual conference. We'll travel a lot. And so pray our travel mercies and or even all the delegates will need to go to the annual conference. And also, uh, yeah, you lift up Helena too. So we uh, pray for her that she can come home like the doctor had, you know, scheduled her tomorrow. It has been delayed for three times and we can feel her frustration. So yeah, pray for her. And I want to uh, thank all who, uh, who said prayers for my brother-in-law's mother-in-law last Sunday, Mrs. Kwok, but she passed away on Monday. So uh, we'll just pray for the Kwok family and the Chu family. Any other uh, joys or concerns? All right, so let us respond by singing, O oh Lord, hear our prayers.
hear now the invitation. We are grateful for the gifts that we receive in our lives. We invite you to participate in this opportunity of generosity to continue the mission of God's love to the world. We are grateful and thankful. So please come forward to place your gifts on the plate at the front of the pews and use a side aisle to get back to your seat. For those on Zoom or online, I invite you to lift your hands up as a sign to offer your gifts. Let us pray. Creating an eternal God, whose grace is sufficient for us and whose power is made perfect in weakness, in our weakness and insufficiency, we offer our lives and the gifts of our, of our living for the work of your mustard seed kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, I'd like to invite all to this table of grace, established by uh, Jesus through his death on the cross. Now, this invitation we'll sing uh, through, well, with our hymns. So let's sing this. This is probably a uh, new hymn to you, but you can open the hymnal and then follow. God of prophets and widows be with you. And also with you. Offer your hearts to God who prepares this table for you. Praise the Creator for all the goodness which is ours. We will sing your life song, God, 
You we praise, O God. You formed the seas, their waters teeming with abundant creatures. You called the earth, planting the myriad of life into its deep soil. You shaped us in your gracious image, imparting the Spirit's breath in us. But we put our trust in mortal death, jealous for its temptations and longings. You sent prophets into the world who challenged us not to fear, but to place our trust in you, yet we return to time again to sin. Keeping faith forever with us, you sent Jesus into our midst to touch us and give us life. So with those, with those whose eyes are being opened, and with those who have been set free, we lift our songs of glad joy to you. You we praise, glorious God, and bless your Son, your Savior, Jesus Christ. When we had nothing but a handful of sin, when there were only a little hope left in our lives, when we despaired in the drought of scarcity, As we come to his table of plenty, as we celebrate the life he gave for us, we speak of that mystery we call faith. You we praise, giver of life. Your spirit moves upon the gift of this table and on those whom the feast has been prepared. We eat, believing that the bread will not fail, but strengthen us to go forth to work. For justice, even as we feed the hungry, we drink, trusting that the cup will not be emptied. As we pour ourselves out in service to those crushed by the oppression, to those held captive by fear, and when we gather where all times had ended, seated with your children, from every time and place around that feast of joy, we will join our voices in praising you forever, singing to God in community, holy in one. Amen. Friends, this is the table of grace. This is Jesus' body, blood, for you. I will serve this Holy, Holy Communion kit first and then the real bread and cup. Donate this body of blood to Jesus Christ. This is the body and blood of Jesus Christ for you. Christ. Okay. Lewis, body and blood of 
God a prize for them. Francis, God a prize for them. How sweet Jesus' grace is for us. Let us give our thanks in unison. Holy Creator, we remember the sacrifice of Jesus and all who follow to bring love and justice to the world. May this bread and drink nourish us as they are the symbol of Christ's essence in all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, let us leave here with God's assurance in our heart, knowing that God's grace is sufficient for us even in our weaknesses. Let us now sing our closing hymn, Blessed Assurance. Please stand as you are able. This is my 
Blessings from God. May the grace of Jesus Christ, the love of our Father in heaven, and also the communion and the presence of the Holy Communion, of the Holy Spirit, be with you all, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.